Okay, so our next bacterium we're going to talk about is Streptococcus and just a brief touch on Enterococcus. So Streptococcus are our catalase negative gram positive cocci. And so you also have a related bacterium of Enterococcus. So Streptococcus, for example, we have um, Strept Galactica and we have Strept Pyogenes. And then we have a series of viridin streptococcus, strep pneumoniae, which is usually handled on its own. And then we have a list of viridins, such as strep mutants and intermedius. Strep pyogenes is group A strep, and group A strep are going to be, again, gram-positive cocci. They're going to have the M protein, which is going to be part of the virulent strains, and M protein is important for adherence. They also have the F protein, which binds fibronectin, which again is for an adherence. M proteins are going to have some differences. If you have a type 1, it's more going to be part of superative infections and rheumatic fever. Type 2 is only going to be superative infections. And then we also have antigen A. And antigen A is going to distinguish each of the different group A streps from other strep groups because they're called group A streps, so this is the A. So this means antigen A would not be found on our viridins and it would not be found on our group B strips, for example. There are also pyoderma, which means pus in the skin. And the um, group A strips are going to be beta hemolytic. As you can see here, where you have the clearing around the bacteria on a blood auger plate. All right, so group A streps have toxins similar to staph, and they have our pyrogenic exotoxin, which is their super antigen. This is gonna be associated with strep toxic shock, as well as necrotizing fasciolitis, which is strep gangrene. We also have streptolysin S, which is its hemolysin, so that's gonna help it lyse those red blood cells, become beta hemolytic, so that's streptolysin S. Streptolysin O is oxygen labile hemolysin, uh, and it's antigenic. And what's interesting is anti-streptolysin O antibodies they are used in the strep, group A strep test. However, they're inhibited by cholesterol. So if you have a cutaneous infection of strep, which there are many, um, you will not Form these antibodies and so this test would not be used for this type of um, cutaneous infection. Streptokinase AB toxin is going to cleave plasminogen and this is going to allow the bacteria to spread and also this is also antigenic so you can use antibodies directed against A and B. Um, DNases are going to depo depolymerize DNA in pus. And again, remember those are coming from those um, neutrophil nets primarily. And again, this uh, similar to what staph did, allows the bacteria to spread. Now, DNase A and D antibodies can form in cutaneous um, tissues. So these can be diagnostic in place of the streptolysin O antigen when you have a cutaneous infection. Now, strep pyogenes has many different types of diseases. A pus forming or superlative disease can be pharyngitis, impetigo, or pyoderma, um, erosyphilis, and cellulitis. So pharyngitis is basically a sore throat fever malaise where you get the pharynx, the posterior pharynx is going to be swollen with an exudate. Um, now, pharyngitis, it's difficult to tell the difference between strep and a virus.
And so these quick strep tests help to do that. And another thing about strep, why it's, hard, why it's important to identify strep and pharyngitis is because you can lead to scarlet fever. And this is a complication. And so basically what's happening in scarlet fever is not every strep pyogenes can cause scarlet fever. It actually has to be lysogenized, have a lysogenic relationship with a bacteriophage that has a pyogenic exotoxin. And then this is going to, scarlet fever is going to include an erythemous rash on the upper chest, which is then going to spread to the extremities, except around the mouth. And the palms and the soles of the feet also will not have the rash. Um, and so scarlet fever leads to a systemic rash, except mouth, palms, and soles. And then also you're going to have a yellow coating on the tongue. And this is going to be shed, and this is going to lead to a raw surface. And you get a strawberry tongue. And so you can see the soles and the feet are spared. Um, next up you have is going to be um, impetigo, or also called pyoderma, which is a purulent infection of the skin. And this is going to be on just exposed areas, so it's not going to be covering the whole entire body. Um, so face, arms, and legs. Um, and this is basically you're introducing the bacterium through a skin cut. And then you're going to have vesicles form. And these are going to be full of pus. Um, these are going to ru uh, rupture. And they'll, scr they'll crest over. Scratching can spread this. There's not going to be a systemic involvement, so you're not going to have any fever. Um, they don't. And what's interesting is this, the strep pyogenes that cause impetigo are different than the strep that causes pharyngitis. But what this guy can do, it can colonize the pharynx and become a persistent carriage. Just as staff will be a persistent carriage in your nasal um, cavity, your strep can become a persistent carriage in your pharynx. Now oral syphilis is an acute infection of the skin and oral syphilis is going to be associated with localized pain and inflammation so warmth in the area. Um, you can also get lymph node enlargement so you have systemic signs. Um, the infected skin can become raised and distinct from uninfected skin, and this is going to be um, commonly in the face and legs and often is going to follow a respiratory or other type of infection.
And then you have cellulitis. Cellulitis is going to involve both the skin plus the sub-Q tissues, subcutaneous tissues, and you're going to have to get precise identification because many organisms can cause cellulitis. Now we also have necrotizing fasciitis, which is strep gangrene. And this is a deep sub-Q infection. And it's going to spread along the facial planes and have extension, destruct, extensive destruction of muscle and fat. This is known as the flesh-eating bacteria. And it's going to enter through a break in the skin. You're initially going to have a cellulitis. And then you're going to have Ebola and gangrene with tissue necrosis. Oops. And it's the same type of gangrene. You're going to have necrosis, and obstruction of blood flow, lack of oxygen, and this, the tissue begins to die. The systemic symptoms are going to be toxicity. Multi-organ failure. And death. So this picture here is a patient who presented with a redness in their skin um, and swelling and they were admitted to the hospital and when they opened up the wound they found extensive damage already to the muscles um, in that area and the bacteria had spread so much that within three days this individual passed away. Now streptococcus can also have toxic shock syndrome, however this is always associated with a bacteremia. or necrotizing fasciitis. So this is a different than with staph. Now our non-superative are going to be like rheumatic fever, which is inflammation of the heart, joints, and blood vessels. And this can have chronic damage to the lungs, to the heart. And then there's no specific diagnostic test, so you're basically going to diagnose this based on clinical findings and possibly um, evidence of a recent uh, strep pyogenes infection. And then as we talked about in immunology, um, acute glomerular nephritis, which is an acute inflammation of the renal glomerula. And this is going to be caused by strep antigens binding to antibodies, creating your aggregates of antibodies and antigens landing on the glomerula and inducing um, inflammation. So you have strep antigens plus antibody complexes um, find land on the glomerula and initiate inflammation. And so that's going to lead to um, edema, hypertension, um, proteinuria, things like that, um, 
and then the root A strips following both your uh, epidermal and pharyngeal infections can lead to oops, sorry, acute glomerular nephritis. So in general diagnosis, you're going to, again, have, be able to do a gram stain. Um, and this is going to be useful for soft tissues because unlike staph, strep is not found on our skin. You also have immunologic tests for throat swabs um, and then nucleic acid tests. Um, keep in mind that when you culture, you can have certain species of streps that will colonize your tonsil area. So you have, or your, your, um, um, your pharynx. And so if you're going to actually look for strep throat, if it's caused by strep versus a virus, you actually really go down into the tonsil area. Now treatment is pretty easy. Um, for most of them, they're gonna be sensitive to penicillin. You, again, can have the pharyngeal carriage um, as of now, there is really no resistance to penicillin in your strep pyogenes. Okay, so next up is our group B strep. Our group B strep um, is a galactica, and this has a polysaccharide capsule. It's very important um, infection of premature infants because premature infants usually are born before they get a massive dose of internal antibodies. So they're not going to have the anti streptococcus antibodies protecting them. In addition, they have a lack of complement, which is very important for extracellular bacteria. Now for streptococcus aglatica, there are three surface markers for identification. You have what's a group specific cell wall polysaccharide B antigen, because this is group B. So group B will have B antigen, group A will have A antigen. There are also going to be nine specific capsular polysaccharides. And they're also going to have a surface C protein, which can be used. Um, some strains are going to have sialic acid on their capsid. And this is going to prevent complement. And so our, our cells have sialic acid. It's important for cell-to-cell -cell interactions and it also protects against complement if complement's around, so strep kind of takes this and mimics this from us um, in order to protect themselves. Now, pregnant women are going to have sometimes colonization, and that's gonna lead to an increased risk of transmitting this bacteria to premature um, infants. So strep agolitica is basically a neonatal disease, so you have an early onset neonatal disease and a late onset neonatal disease. Early is basically going to be within a week of birth you develop this infection, and late is going to be one week to three months. And so for the early onset, you're going to get bacteremia, pneumonia, or meningitis. Um, and for the late onset, it's always going to be associated with bacteremia and meningitis. Now the Group B strep is also going to have beta hemolysis on blood auger, and you can see that it forms these nice little um, uh, chains. And there's also tests for pregnant women to check to see if they are colonized with this particular bacterium before they give birth. Now, streptococcus pneumonia is a viridin strep, but it's kind of kept in its own little category. This guy is a little bit different because it forms a diplococcus. It does not form those nice long chains. It has a capsule um, and it has um, a different hemolysis. So it can be either alpha or beta um, hemolytic. It just depends how you um, culture the bacteria. So if you put it in an aerobic environment where there's oxygen, it will be alpha hemolytic. 
if you put it in an anaerobic environment, it will be beta hemolytic. It also has pneumonolysin, which is going to degrade hemoglobin. Um, and this leaves a green product, so it looks a little bit green on your blood auger plate. Um, now, in the in a patient, your pneumonolysin is going to bind to cholesterol and create pores, similar to what a complement a MAC, the um, attack uh, MAC attack proteins would do, poke holes in bacteria. Well, strep pneumonia can poke holes in our cells. Um, and they like to kill ciliated epithelial cells as well as phagocytic cells. It has fastidious growth, which means that it requires nutrients. Um, so it has to have nutrients supplemented with blood products. It does not like to grow in glucose-rich medium, and this is because it metabolizes so fast that it generates lactic acid, which becomes toxic. There are also polyvalent vaccines available that target those different capsules so you can get vaccinated against this. Now, pneumococcal disease um, is by strep pneumoniae, and these are penicillin-resistant strep. So he's talked about strep pyogenes was highly susceptible. Penis, um, strep pneumoniae is going to be more resistant, and the resistant ones you have to treat with vancomycin, for example. Now these are going to present with an abrupt um, uh, pneumonia. It's a low bar of pneumonia, um, and it's going to usually follow a virus infection, and that's important because unlike strep pyogenes, strep pneumonia doesn't have that many virulence factors, but a virus will move in like COVID-19, wipe out your um, ciliated cells and allow pneumonia, strep pneumonia to gain access to your lungs. Children and the elderly, elderly are going to have more of a bronchial pneumonia, so a generalized pneumonia, um, instead of the low bar pneumonia. Those anti-capsule antibodies that are in that vaccine, or if you've been exposed, are going to be protective. Uh, strep pneumonia also can cause sinus, sinusitis and ot otitis media, which is the middle ear infection. Um, and so these are going to be acute infections, and again, these are again they're usually going to follow virus infections. The meningitis and bacteremia are common in neonates, um, but are going to be more common in adults and children. Now, our true viridin strep is um, also strep pneumonia falls into this category, but it's a very homogeneous, heterogeneous group. Uh, strep mutants, for example, the one that can infect your, your mouth and cause cavities, dental caries, is part of the viridin strep. So they're going to colonize various areas of our body. They have low pathogenic potential. Um, however, if you have an immunocompromised individual, um, they can cause some problems. And again, strep pneumonia is a member of viridins. And finally, enterococcus. So enterococcus is a gram-positive coccus, and it has pairs or short chains. This is going to always be a, a nosocomial infection in the hospital. They are antibiotic resistant. Um, you're going to have to treat these guys um, with different types of antibiotics. So they are going to be resistant to our penicillins as well as vancomycin and cephalosporins. So you can treat them with an aminoglycoside, for example. They can colonize your GI tract and your genital urinary tract, but they're usually kept at under control by your normal flora. And it's really when your um, normal flora are wiped out um, that they can move in. They are optation, optin resistant, and strep pneumonia is sensitive, so you can tell the difference between the two. And that's important because they kind of look alike. This one kind of looks like a little diplococcus. Um, risk factors are going to be catheters. Again, this is hospital-acquired, prolonged hospitalization, and use of broad-spectrum antibiotics. Um, diagnostic is a PYR test. is a spot measure test of a particular enzyme in, in your enterococcus, and this is a five-minute test. But please note that strep pyogenes is also positive for this um, PYR test.